Welcome to the final lecture in CIS Microeconomics. Yay, you made it. Uh, today we're going to talk about labor and derived demand. And um, this is kind of piggybacking off of some of the concepts that we learned about yesterday um, regarding the value of the marginal product. Um, so we're just going to kind of take those ideas a little bit farther today. Nothing earth shattering or nothing new that you probably haven't thought about or heard of before. This is just a little bit more of a generic topic just to think about. So um, in competitive labor markets, wages are determined um, based upon the supply and demand for the labor. So the demand for labor is, as we learned yesterday, based on the marginal productivity or the value of the marginal product of um, the inputs. And so that demand curve for labor um, is going to, as we know, become the value of the marginal product of labor curve. And the increase in revenue when additional unit of labor is hired is the VMPL. And we also learned yesterday that firms are going to hire workers until the point when the marginal cost, or the, the amount they have to pay that worker, the wage, is equal to the marginal benefit, or the VMPL, that that worker will then bring in. So there are some shifts in demand for labor um, when various things happen. So because demand for labor is a derived demand, and what that means is that the demand for the labor is based upon or derived from the demand for the good or service that is being produced from that labor, what this means is that an increase in demand for a product will cause the price of that product to increase and therefore increase the demand for labor for that product. So an investment in human capital is also going to increase the value of the marginal product of labor or the VMPL, the demand for labor curve, because our workers will become more and more productive. So who would get paid more? I think the answer to this question is pretty obvious. Um, and if I were to ask you why, um, I think that you would have a very easy time coming up with an answer for me. Um, and your answer would probably center around the fact that a surgeon is more scarce and requires more training and education than a taxi driver. But if I asked you this question, um, you might have a little tougher time coming up with an answer. So in this example, um, this would be based upon the quantity of labor available and limiting entry into the profession. So I, I'm sure many of you know a teacher or someone with a teaching degree, I should say, that does not currently have a teaching job and would love to find one. Um, whereas many software developers, people coming out of college with similar degrees and training, are snatched up right away because the demand for those workers is so much higher than demand for teachers right now. Teachers are getting laid off left, left and right um, with the fiscal um, constraints of our current economic situation. So it's not just the supply of the labor, but also the demand for the labor that's going to um, determine the pay for those different professions that are out there. So income, as we said, is determined based on supply of and demand for various types of labor. Wages differ because, first of all, there are many labor markets. Each has its own supply and demand curve. Each has its own equilibrium wage. And most labor markets are competitive. Not all are competitive, but most are. And therefore, income is going to depend on the quantity and the quality of the resources that are available for hire and the supply of and demand for those resources. So the amount of education and training that's required, um, the amount of skill level required, you know, is this a job that just anybody can do or not? Um, those, those questions are all very important in determining the supply of and demand for these resources and therefore the equilibrium wage rate or income that's going to result. So in a competitive labor market, this um, supply and demand graph will look something like this. Here's demand for the labor or businesses. And here's the supply of workers. So the equilibrium wage rate would be where supply equals demand. 
Uh, several things may influence demand for labor. One thing would be the price of the final good or demand in the product market. Again, because demand for resources and labor is derived from demand for the final product, um, then as the price of that final good fluctuates, the demand in the product, the demand in the labor market is going to fluctuate as well. So unions play a big role in increasing demand for union-made products through advertising and public opinion and things like that. Um, therefore, you know, encouraging the price of that good to increase and therefore the quantity of labor demanded to produce those products to also increase. Um, the productivity of the labor is also going to influence the demand for labor. Um, the marginal product and the supply of other factors as well as technology are going to cause the VMPL to, to shift. And the supply of labor is going to be affected by many things such as the size of the available working population. Uh, the non-monetary attractiveness of a job, you know, things that attract someone to a profession other than the amount of money that they're earning for doing that job. For example, one of the reasons that I, I knew I wanted to be a teacher is I knew that I wanted to have holidays off and, you know, we never have school on, on official holidays, so that's one example of non-monetary attractiveness. Um, abilities and training and education that's available and required and then unions um, monopolize the sale of labor for various industries. So unions play a big role not only in increasing demand for the product uh, and therefore the labor for the product, but also in monopolizing the sale of the labor so they affect the supply curve as well. All right, now supply of labor is equal to demand for leisure. We could say that these two things are, uh, these two ideas are one and the same because um, when you are at work, you're not enjoying leisure time. And when you are enjoying leisure time, you're not working. <laughs> so, um, as wages increase, the supply of labor will shift. The quantity of labor that's supplied, the number of people who are willing and able to work at various wages is going to increase or decrease based upon what the equilibrium wage is. Um, so this is all explains the substitution effect. As the cost of leisure, leisure increases, um, we're going to have a positively sloped supply curve and people are going to you know, work more and more hours. And the income effect also shows us that as people increase their wealth, um, the supply curve will be negatively sloped. So they get what this means is people get to a point in time where um, they have enough money and offering them more money to work more hours doesn't work anymore. They, they value their leisure time more than more money. So here's what this looks like. At this point in the supply curve for labor, the substitution effect outweighs the income effects. Here they balance each other out and as you get to these very high wage rates, um, wealth the income effect outweighs the substitution effects and some people say you know what I'm gonna back up I'm not gonna work as much because I value my leisure time over earning more money I have enough money I don't need any more money so um, that just explains kinda why the supply curve sometimes has an interesting shape rising wages enable workers to provide for their families with fewer hours of work the income effect of rising wages may account for labor supply going in the quote-unquote wrong direction as we just explained so shorter hours worked as real wages rose and longer hours worked as wages fell. And that makes sense. The less money you make, the more hours you put in. The more money you, you make, typically the less hours you are willing and able to put in. All right, and that's, that's it. That's all she wrote.